Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Australian Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. I'm Professor Jing Han, the director of this institute. As usual, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that our institute is on Parramatta South campus, which is on the country of the Darug people of the Darug nation. And we would like to acknowledge their ancestors being the traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. We also would like to pay our respect to First Nations elders of the countries that we're all sitting on today, past, present, and emerging. Today, we will have our session five of Chinese Australian History Online Series 2022. And it involves a very interesting topic, which has not been covered before. It is for home and abroad, a century of a Chinese Australian di 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 diaspora educational philanthropy in Zhongshan. The, this talk concerns the pre tertiary schools financed by the di diaspora originating from Zhongshan country in Guangdong province. I think uh, it is a part of the PhD research by Christopher Chen. Christopher is the first PhD candidate of this institute, and I'm so pleased that he's about to graduate a tiny bit, and he will soon get his degree. Um, so it's not surprising that uh, Christopher um, is talking about this topic, because Christopher knows firsthand the double pains of being disconnected from his Chinese roots, and then the, at the same time, not firmly grounded in his parents' migrant country of Australia. Interesting to note the wording that he used. Christopher had his further studies in Guangzhou and Hong Kong after completing the first part of his architecture, architectural degree in Brisbane. In 2017, he joined the China Australian Heritage Corridor team as a PhD student and has been researching and publishing his field observations in academic and popular outlets so that other children in the diaspora can also benefit, as Christopher puts it. It's very interesting to note that um, Christopher's attention on children of migrants, not just migrants, which is so interesting and another layer of a complexity in our migration history. As always, we will take questions from the audience at the end of the lecture. So please post your questions at the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And um, I will collect them when Christopher finish the talk. Now, please welcome Christopher Chen to give us his presentation. Four and a half years ago, I walked into Parramatta South Campus for the first time. And I was surprised to find Chinese characters on one of the very first buildings I set my eyes on. I would soon find out that the signage displayed the name of the institute that funded my doctorate scholarship. I thank my supervisors and the institute board for providing this opportunity. Last month in Canberra, I presented at China in the World. There, I discussed how migrant heritage of Australia could be identified and managed. I drew up my field research on schools funded by Chinese Australians as an example of migrant heritage owned by people, both in Australia and China. Today's talk will explore the history of modern schools built by Australian, the Australian Zhongshan diaspora in Zhongshan. Did you know that modern 20th century schools built in Southern China were not only built by the diaspora, but they were also built to sustain the diaspora. My presentation today is based on a new journal article that is about to be published. It chronicles the development of homeland educational philanthropy over the past century. The idea of this article began in, uh, in 2017 when I started this research. Dr. Michael Williams was just finishing his first monograph and suggested that my PhD could extend his own research by studying both the pre-1949 Kilhelm 
and the post 80s home locality. My talk does that and more. It looks at three distinct periods. The third is post 2010s when China is economically richer and no longer needs to rely on its diaspora. For those who are familiar with Chinese people, we know they tend to think about money. In the reprint of a two, uh, in the reprint of a 1910s Australian newspaper article, Chinese shops, qin, or money in Cantonese was described as the only pursuit of the Chinese. Money was a subject that their hearts were full of, but rarely enough. But behind the seemingly single-minded emphasis on wealth creation, Chinese immigrants' contributions to public welfare remain poorly understood. One reason for this is culture. Zhao and Fitzgerald found that humility means that donors rarely bragged about their deeds. More recently, John Fitzgerald has concluded in his article, Building Trust, that Chinese immigrants were not only profit oriented but also public minded. Moreover, according to Gregor Benton and Liu Hong, charity begins at home. Here, home specifically refers to the ancestral locale in China. In the United States, Paula Johnson, a scholar of philanthropy, noted that Chinese invested in commercial ventures in the homeland, but they were also enthusiastic to contribute to the educational sector, believing that the best way to give back to the community, that it was the best way to give back to the community and country. This two-pronged approach emphasized the dual commercial and social aspirations of the Chinese in America. Yin Xiaohuang noted that Chinese immigrants to the United States are more willing to do business outside their ancestral locality in China, but still eager to take part in charitable work in their ancestral homes. Their behavior can be understood through comparative research. In a study on how Asian Australian philanthropists give, why they give, where they give, and what kinds of causes they support, Joe and Fitzgerald found that whether in historical or modern times, the relationship between lineage or hometown and the diaspora was crucial. This may be because persistent deprivation in the place of origin had created a niche for charities to flourish and provided the diaspora with a window for intervention. A recent study on Sun Er Dai, the so-called charitable second generation in China, shows how attitudes towards giving changed over two generations of Chinese-born philanthropists. They found that the Nobel rich were often unsophisticated in their distribution of money compared to their, high, their highly educated children, who often had the fortune of studying abroad as well as the philanthropic experience of their parents. Thus, rather than making one of large sum donations, later generations tend to be more ambitious about how capital was distributed. Other than disaster relief, contributions to health and education, which were the priority of their parents' generation, the charitable second generation were more willing to be hands-on and to dedicate their talent and time to collaborative and experimental partnerships that they considered to be socially beneficial. Such generational change is also found among the Zhongshan Australian diaspora I discuss in my talk today. In general, the variable nature of giving means that diaspora philanthropy rarely conforms to established models. Due to its evolving nature, scholars have noted that diaspora philanthropy is one of the least understood as well as the least documented facets of the philanthropic landscape, it has even been described by some scholars as a blank slate. Research on the topic, according, according to Paula Johnson, can therefore potentially reveal the interests, attitudes, and aspirations of migrant contributors. In the first issue 
of philanthropy and education. The founding editor encouraged comparative questions regarding the movement of practices across borders and within different contexts. This objective runs counter to the predominant focus of education philanthropy in the US and the UK, especially in the fields of higher education. Seeking to transcend existing scholarship in the Anglosphere, this talk presents an original non-Western case study of diaspora education philanthropy. Here, education philanthropy refers to those preschools, primary schools and secondary schools funded by the diaspora in the ancestral villages and towns of Zhongshan in Southern China. In China, the first reported case of an immigrant funded school occurred in 1872, when Yongwen donated 500 silver tassel to fund Yanyin School in his Pearl River Delta hometown of Zhongshan. Another famous school funded by the diaspora in Guangdong was Toishan Number no. 1 Middle School. In his article, Building Trust, John Fitzgerald described the school, Toshan Number no. 1 Middle School, as a remarkable testimony to the generosity and professionalism of the early Chinese Canadian donors working within homeland traditions to achieve something that has never been accomplished on that scale to that time. More than 100 years later, many schools in the Pearl River Delta, such as Toshan No. 1 Middle School and Yanyin School, still stand as material remnants of another era. Many schools like these remain in use despite them being a product of a bygone collective vision for an alternative future for China. To understand the involvement of the diaspora over the past century, my doctoral research is a case study of how Chinese Australians from Zhongshan County have engaged with educational philanthropy in the native home in the Pearl River Delta. Data collected, a data collection occurred between 2017 and 2021 as part of the China Australian Heritage Corridor project and involved on-site documentation as well as photographic analysis in China, interviews, library and archival research in China and Australia. I analyzed 30 school buildings in Zhongshan to illustrate the changing nature of education philanthropy since the beginning of the 20th century. This talk postulates that changes in diaspora initiated education philanthropy in the Qilheng in Southern China correspond to three distinct periods of Chinese migration. Over the past century, diaspora initiated education philanthropy also had three distinct phases. First, creating a future that honors the past. Second, to continue a tradition while diversifying educational needs. And thirdly, to leave a legacy that may illuminate future generations of school children. The first two phases involve intensive school building activities in the early and late 20th century. This occurred when immigrant sojourners from geographically split households were expected by those they left behind in China to make money abroad to improve their lives. The second phase involves settlers who returned to their ancestral home after China reopened its borders in 1978. The final phase is taking place now in the 21st century when contributions can no longer be quantified in material terms. Together, these three phases show how a non-Western diaspora group has reformed the educational needs of the native place over the past century. Now I'd like to discuss stage one. How did the diaspora create a new future in the early 20th century? One of the most extraordinary social developments of the early 20th century was the transformation of a cohort of illiterate peasant immigrants into school builders. 
Through overseas immigration, Chinese peasants became, in Adam McEwen's words, a dispensable, exportable commodity. In addition to bringing muscle overseas, the Cantonese in Australia also imported an array of age-old skills, including water management, which served, which served them well on the gold fields and the market gardens, which they dominated after the gold rush subsided. Clearly, they were not simply importers. They were also creating a new Chinese-Australian culture, introducing new crops, demonstrating the value of intensive agriculture and reorganizing themselves to work effectively with European farmers and investors. Migration clearly enriched the cultural repertoire of heritage in Australia, yet cultural transfers were not one way, as our research on the heritage corridor shows. The accumulation of new skills abroad economic capital and new ideas also transformed Southern China as well. Backbreaking back labor laid in the economic foundation for career transformation. Historians such as Kathy May, for example, have noted that for the upwardly mobile, market gardening served as a springboard for entry into other small businesses. Capital accumulation ultimately, ultimately led to a stable business such as a grocery shop. In the, 20, in the 20th century, this was a common phenomenon in many parts of Australia. The late Stanley Hunt, a former president of the Jongsan Society of Australia noted that many shops in New South Wales have been operated by members of his native place in Australia. The Jongsan folk provide a distinctive case illustrating the transition from market, um, I'll say that again. The Jongsan folk provide a distinctive case illustrating the transition from migrant labour to entrepreneurs and eventually school builders. Due to their struggles, many early Chinese in Australia realized how they were handicapped by being unschooled. They understood that practical literacy and numeracy were essential to keeping abreast with business as well as corresponding with family in their home country. Due to a low level of literacy, letters that reached a native home in China were rarely penned by migrant authors themselves. And when there were responses, few recipients could read them. The literate few working in the remittance agencies in the hometown or as scribes in country shops in Australia were called upon to read and write these letters. An 85 year old that I interviewed in Juksalgin village in Jongsan explained why many immigrant benefactors enthusiastically contributed to education. He said, even though some became rich, they still had a challenging time signing their own names. Even those big bosses, the hands shook whenever they were given a pen. Keep in mind that many had never had the chance to go to school and had trouble writing even in Chinese. At the time, at the time funding a new school did not necessarily entail a, a new building. Early modern schools were, were often no different from the traditional schools housed in ancestral halls. Oops. Some were even converted houses or church buildings. This situation changed in the early 20th century as the Kuomintang Dong Nationalist Party implemented a modern system of primary school education. Among the diaspora, overseas donations were then directed towards fulfilling a general desire to build new schools in the place of origin. These initiatives were primarily led by self-made men, Chinese sojourners who, in a generation or two, had risen from agricultural or laboring backgrounds to become merchants. They owned shops, were engaged in trade, 
in regional Australia who are shareholders in modern department stores in Hong Kong and other Chinese cities in the early 20th century. In many cases, donors often came from humble origins and felt the importance of education because without it, they knew full well the everyday hardships. Mai Ying Bill, a notable philanthropist, made his first bucket of gold in Australia trading bananas. He believed that children were the future of society and commented that if we have schools for boys, girls cannot go without. He understood that girls would eventually become mothers and that mothers were the backbone of society. So breaking from a tradition that reserved educational resources only for boys, he built new schools for women and children in his home village of Samachung, today South District of Chungsan. Considering that tens of thousands of children across China were missing out the opportunity for an education because they had to work to support their families, Mai Ying Bill envisaged eradicating illiteracy nationwide. In 1914, he produced a 5,000 character reader as a self-help guide to promote literacy. While the standard Chinese dictionary contains 50,000 characters, only one tenth are frequently used, hence his choice of a 5,000 character reader. After publishing this book, Mai encouraged the staff of his Hong Kong company, Sincere Department Store, telling them that after learning to read, literate staff might even be promoted. Commercial and social aspirations obviously went hand in hand. Having discussed the desire of the diaspora for universal education, I now look at the modern school buildings funded in Southern China. Often these buildings were high quality structures, even though they were deep in the countryside. When asked about the school project that, the wife, that his wife's grandfather initiated, Howard Wilson articulated the aspirations of the school founder, James Choi Heng, made the school last for a thousand years. If we could focus on the photo on the screen, it shows the remarkably modern Western appearance of the school in present day Zhuhoi. Its non-Chinese aesthetic may be attributed to the cosmopolitanism of its founders, men who were also at the forefront of China's commercial scene. Such schools represent the donor's wish to make a lasting contribution to the native home. Some school donors record how their agricultural livelihoods were devastated by torrential rain and widespread flooding. Having seen such misfortunes, they were unwilling to accept anything less than a sturdy building when they built new schools. Immigration thus not only provided the funds for the construction of modern schools in the countryside, but also introduced new materials that ordinary farming families could not afford. Built of reinforced concrete, multi-story school buildings made their, made new star schools more inclusive than the past because they were substantially larger. With a student capacity of a few hundred, whereas old style schools in ancestral halls could only accommodate a few dozen. The new, the new style schools in Dailang Village and Sachong, for example, could accommodate 300 students each, while the five and a half story labor school accommodate 400 students. In China's post-reform era, Diaspora funded schools welcomed even more students. Mashan School, for example, accommodated over 800 students in his two story building. The greater number meant that children from neighboring villages could attend 
as well as those from the village where the school was situated. After graduation, some students went on to succeed their fathers or uncles in overseas businesses, while others were recruited by department stores in the Chinese cities. Those who stayed in the countryside became teachers in other newly established schools, yet not all outcomes were positive. Driven by economy dependent on remittance, some graduates continued their ill habits, such as opium, prostitution and gambling, which according to Benton Leal, education was intended to alleviate. According to Michael Williams, this was not only because education did not always provide an alternative, alternative career pathway, but also because some young men returning to farming was a disgrace that their families would not accept. Clearly, in both positive and negative ways, the diaspora altered the destinies of the next generation and in the process transformed the statuses of immigrant donors, as I will now explain. Although Cholbin School, established in 1929, no longer functions as a school today, the names of its, founder, of its founders, men who operated shops in regional Queensland, for example, remain visibly inscribed on the stone as shown on the screen. This finding is consistent with previous research on schools dating from the early 20th century elsewhere in the Pearl River Delta. See, for example, Renchu Yu's article of schools in Toishan. It is evident that despite the benefactors long absence overseas due to their working life abroad in the pre-communist phase, that is before 1949, it was still considered important that they be recognized for their philanthropic deeds. At Jok Salyun School, established in 1932, many donors' portraits were hung inside the assembly hall. The school was a coordinated effort by Wing On Department Store which combined the contributions of more than 150 individuals. The widespread support for the school can be summed up in the words of one of the fundraiser who presided over the, the opening of the school. When I asked those around me in Shanghai, not one person opposed to building a brand new school in our village. The evidence presented so far suggests that in the first phase, of education philanthropy, diaspora accumulation of wealth and contact with the world outside exacerbated the desire to create an alternative future through education in the native home. In turn, the once unschooled migrant laborers transformed themselves into school benefactors and their names were immortalized on the school's fabric in China. Decades later, these pioneering efforts provide a model for later generations to follow and improve. Now, I'd like to move on to stage two to examine how educational philanthropy diversified in the late 20th century. Following the economic reforms of the 1980s is evident from the Kilhern regions that the diaspora revived the enthusiasm for educational philanthropy. The reason for this was that many villages in the early reform period still had inadequate facilities. After a decade, when travel back to China had not been possible, restrictions were, restrictions were relaxed and many overseas Chinese revisited the native villages. But still, after heavy rain, for instance, the sight of school desks and chairs semi-submerged in floodwaters disheartened those who returned and they felt compelled to contribute to building new schools in their villages. Such spur of the moment fundraising activity was fondly described by a former officer of the Zhongshan Kilban or the Overseas Chinese Affairs Office who recalled that 
one person after seeing the neglected conditions of the village put in 1,000, another chips in 1,500. Soon, tens, and thousands, tens of thousands were gathered, a sum that could go a long way. I imagine the spirit at the time was like that of those who contributed to Dr. Sun's revolution. The overseas, the overseas Chinese led the way. Accounts by the Australian diaspora, however, sometimes revealed a less enthusiastic response. Potential benefactors had by now settled permanently in Australia. Some have been established groceries, stores while others ran restaurants. But after the atrocity of the decade long cultural revolution, many families were reluctant to return, let alone contribute to rebuilding China. In one interview I conducted in Cantonese with the daughter of a school donor, Mrs. Felicia Sita recounted the experience of her late father, Lerman Hon. In the late 1970s, he was one of the first to return to his native village of Chobin. Like everyone else, he was afraid, yet he had adored his village and dearly missed his friends and relatives there. Some of whom he managed to stay in touch with. His safe return, along with that of the first returnees to other villages, boosted the confidence of the other homecoming diaspora leading to the regeneration of the ancestral home. Having fond memories of the village where they had grown up as children of Australian immigrants meant that even in their busy adult lives, they had not forgotten about their ancestral home. Le Man Hon ran a Chinese restaurant in Milton, Brisbane, while his childhood friend, Philip Leung, also from Chobie, the same village, operated a supermarket chain in Townsville. After hearing from Men Hon the conditions of his home village, Philip paid to install a village gate, pave roads, shelter the marketplace, and erect a factory that would collect rent to support the village school. A kindergarten was also collectively funded mainly by council-based compatriots. These projects were initiated by two former village boys who had cultivated a lasting friendship due to their privileged status as left behind children supported by remittances from Queensland. Unlike half a century earlier, when families had been primarily based in China, the situation had changed by the 1980s. And as a result, the Chinese settlers in Australia were less forthcoming with contributions. Some families preferred to set aside their hard earning savings, their hard earned savings for other purposes, such as new cars, children's home deposits, or as inheritances for the next generation. These competing family scripts created new conversations about whether it was worth contributing to a far away former home. Felicia Sito remembered her mother yelling at her father, don't you feel like a beggar going around asking for donations all the time? In 1987, a donation of 10,000 Hong Kong dollars earned the donor immortality. Some potential donors snapped at Le Man Hong. I have already donated a few thousand mu or Chinese acres of land to the communists. Isn't that enough? Felicia explained the irony of the word donated. You must understand there, were, there was a class known as landlords who had made money overseas, buying lots of land and property, shops to collect rent, etc. After the liberation in 1949, these people were tortured. Their houses and properties were confiscated. So when dad asked for donations, some families were reminded of what they had lost. Glenn Peterson described the 1950s land reform as a government initiated property distribution campaign that has specifically attacked the foundations of the transnational family as an institution for generating wealth. Considering what China had been through 
and how by the 1980s, every family was orientated differently. There was greater excuses to say no to donation requests. This response is more striking when compared to half a generation, uh, half a century earlier. In the early 20th century, immigrant businesses in China were boycotted if they were found that the owners had failed to contribute to a new school in the village. One initiative introduced from the mid 1980s onwards was to put projects under a matching fund. This scheme meant that local authorities and partnership with um, migrant donors overseas. For, for instance, between 1887 and 1994, Stanley Yi teamed up with other Daichong clansmen in Fiji, Hong Kong, and Macau to fund Chokesa Middle School. According to the Chongsan Overseas Chinese Affairs records, the migrant donors amassed over 6 million yuan for a school project of 12.3 million yuan. Through this scheme, the government demonstrated its commitment to partnering with migrant donors to fund a new school project. As a result, the Kilhelm saw a re revival of school construction activity in the 1980s and 1990s. The post Mao reform in the 1980s changed the nature and expectation of education in China. In this period, the diaspora not only funded the expansion of primary schools, but also commissioned new kindergartens and middle schools in the Kilhelm. According to one donor, the reason for building a kindergarten was to increase household income. Mrs. Eileen Lai told me in Cantonese during our interview in North Sydney that her decision to build a kindergarten in her native village was not only because she had grown up without much education, but also because a childcare facility such as what was widely available in Australia would free village women from parental duties. Allowing mothers to work in the many new made in China factories that were springing up in Southern China would provide households with an extra in income. Mrs. Lai recalled that after she and her late husband, Alan, returned to China in 1979, Mr. Lai told her, Eileen, we saw that people in China were very poor. My dream, and hope that you will agree with me, making it our dream, I want to build a school, a kindergarten in your village, in memory of your mother and father. Eileen agreed. After returning to Australia, the couple ran two restaurants, Lin San Lao and the Eastern restaurant, Dong San Jiao Ga, in Sydney's Chinatown, and started other businesses as they endeavoured to make more money to finance their new project. Other Zhongshan Australian families, like the Hunts, the Yuans, would also build schools in their own ancestral villages. Intergenerational businesses, such as Sincere and Wing On department stores in Hong Kong, earned reputation for their corporate social responsibility due to their continual investment in homeland education. One of, the most invest, one of the most impressive contributions was from Miss Jen Wei Wan, who single-handedly funded Bok Oi Middle School, a 1 million yuan project in her native Sam Heung hometown in the 1980s. In general, China's reform period education system was defined by children starting school at an early age and ending later. And by a greater emphasis on a diverse range of specialized learning. The later was visible in the Kilhelm schools by the variety of equipment donated by the diaspora and the suite of new specialist rooms. <laughs> 
For example, music rooms, audio visual rooms, art studios, science labs, and computer rooms. One middle school even had a swimming pool. Another defining feature of this era was the diversity of school equipment donated when migrant donors and the descendants returned to the village. These included new library books, musical instruments, sporting equipment, and electronic goods. These gifts ensured that the schools remained well equipped. When I interviewed the village chief of Sa Chong village, Mark Yitler, he said that he felt his elementary school was exceptional. Due to the generous support of the Hong Kong Sincere Department Store. He said that when he attended Sincere School in the 1990s, we were the only primary school at the time in Zhongshan to have computers. Ma continued to record the special experience after turning on the, on the computer. I want to know how it worked. I sat there in front of the computer exploring away with a cool, gentle breeze from the electric fan from the electric fan blowing onto me. We must remember that in the early years, Zhongshan villagers who had come of age under the People's Republic of China sat outside their village homes on sweltering summer evenings with only handheld foldable fans or peach-shaped bamboo fans to stir a gentle breeze. Electric fans, like computers, were luxury futuristic products that made their debut appearance in a diaspora-funded school in the 1980s and 1990s. In a walking interview with the headmaster of Jeonkok Primary School, Mr. Yeo pointed out the value of having specialized equipment. Before 1985, the old school didn't have any electricity. Definitely no pianos, no art studios, no computers, no technology whatsoever. Take for example, a performing art stage without it. How could students learn about and exhibit their talents? Having it allows them to sing, dance and show off their skills in public, which would also increase their confidence. In short, the second stage of diaspora educational philanthropy, like the first, followed a period of severe shortage in China. Turmoil during the period of high socialism also created some resentment among potential overseas donors. Nevertheless, some continued to diversify the educational offerings, supporting a wider range of initiatives that were aimed at broadening the horizons of children in the ancestral home. Now, I'd like to move on to the third stage to discuss how future generations of diaspora funded school students continue to be illuminated in the 21st century. Since the 2010s, China is no longer independent but no longer financially dependent on its diaspora. And consequently, the traditional forms of diaspora philanthropy, such as creating institutions are falling out of favor and a new landscape is emerging. An example of this is a direct transfer of expertise and skills. Despite being in her 90s, the granddaughter of Ma Ying Pil, Dr. Ma Pui Han, has been returning to her ancestral home from Hong Kong every year. As an award-winning photographer, Dr. Ma has reproduced photographs for the current children of Sa Chong. Like her Chinese-Australian migrant grandfather who built a school in his native village a century ago, in her own way, Dr. Ma continues to bring the outside world back to the village through her photography. The above account implies that ongoing contributions should not simply be counted as economic or material remittances, but should also include the immaterial or social remittances, those of ideas, meanings, and practices.
This shift is emerging at a time when China's relationship with the diaspora has evolved. According to Stuart Hall, diasporas are constantly producing and reproducing themselves anew through transformation and difference. In the current case, the returning diaspora will most likely continue to contribute to the homeland by way of their linguistic skills, contacts and expertise. And in the process, they may feel like they have, they will feel that they have been empowered by the ability to continually make a difference. As shown so far, diaspora funded schools can usually influence the diversification can usually influence the diversification of learning opportunities. This feature continues into the 21st century. Former students and current staff have confirmed a direct link between diaspora ties and school excursions. One reason for this is that heritage sites in the native home, elsewhere in China and even overseas are deemed significant to the school. The headmaster of Juxiao Yun School mentioned that retelling history benefits from context as he elaborated on his plans to take his students to Nanking Road in Shanghai, where the school's founders established the flagship wing on department store in Republican Shanghai. Furthermore, it is worth noting that diaspora funded schools in Zhongshan were not only connected to multiple sites through migration or business, but even through financial sponsorship. And that also has established new connections. As a former student who attended Zhongshan Overseas Chinese Middle School or Qingzhong in Seki, in the first decade of the 20th century record, because the school donors had overseas connections, there were subsidized exchange programs to Japan or South Korea. Of course, we still had to pay, but because of the donors' connections, it provided more chances for us to travel. A teacher at that school confirmed this was the case because the patron had funded science centers, museums, and research institutes throughout East Asia. Thus, according to William Kirby, lines between things international or global or external on one hand and things Chinese on the other are in many realms nearly impossible to draw. All these factors contribute to contemporary schools in the Kilhelm, maintaining a sense of diasporic history while also having a newfound sense of global modernity. Hence, the history of migration continues to be a resource to be tapped into, giving meaning to the present and informing the future. Now, let's overview diaspora, oops, diaspora education philanthropy in China in the past century. Through analyzing the material heritage of the school, of the school, such as the donor plaques and photographs, some observations can be made. In the earlier phase of immigration, that is the pre-communist era, schools were financed by a coalition of sojourning men. By the end of the 20th century, the school family had settled, the donor school family had settled overseas and the situation changed. Schools built in the later part of the century include the coalescence of husband and wives and or siblings and cousins. These schools were dedicated to the memory of their parents who were migrants rather than the individual migrants, which was common in the earlier era. An unanticipated finding of this study was that gender equality in the donor pool increased over time. It must be remembered that in traditional society, Chinese women did not have a name and a voice. They listened to their fathers, husbands, and when widowed, their sons. Yet as migrant women were greater in numbers overseas, they also become 
active advocates in improving education in the homeland, reminiscent of the earlier generation of sojourning men. Beginning in the 1980s, women's names appeared on plaques and their portraits were proudly hung at schools in the native or in their husband's ancestral homes. This observation does not differ somewhat from the findings of the study in New York, where one participant remarked that he could not imagine contributing to a school other than that, other than his own, unless he was married, in which case he would be supporting his wife's alamata. Expressing a similar sentiment, one woman said, I don't think anyone gives the school they didn't go unless they have some family connection or enormous amounts of money to throw away. Unlike the situation in New York, the emergence of Chinese women overseas as, a, as loan contributors and partners in philanthropic projects is obviously related to the rising status of Chinese women in the transnational business community. From a broader perspective, it is important to understand the context of diaspora philanthropy. At the beginning of the 20th century, China considered education as a necessity for national salvation. Behind the rebuilding of the ancestral home through education, there was an intensive desire to overcome a marginal self-image of the overseas Chinese at home and abroad. Although new schools became symbols of the newfound importance of education, they were equally meaningful to the migrant donors. Through philanthropy, these people became community leaders in and beyond the native home so that their contributions could be classified as a tradition within a tradition. And this tradition stretches back to empirical times. At the same time, educational philanthropy transcends tradition. After all, diaspora funded schools depend in the long run on at least the two way connection for new ideas, school equipment, and practices. During, during legacy is not only between Zhongshan and Sydney or Townsville, it also includes what Elizabeth Sin calls in between places where the donor's family transited or work, such as in Hong Kong, Shanghai, San Francisco. Put differently, the schools that materialized in Zhongshan before 1949 eventually groomed a new generation of business leaders in the diaspora. These beneficiaries became the future Chinese Australian business community. My data confirms Philip Wong's finding that Pacific Rim children were brought up to expand the commercial interests of their predecessors. Therefore, in the ancestral locality in Southern China, therefore, if the ancestral locality in Southern China was once figuratively described by Adam Kuhn as schools for immigrants, the actual schools financed by immigrants were not merely places of socialization, but were central to the long-term survival of the Cantonese, both at home in China and abroad. Now to conclude, in this presentation, I've shown that for a long time, Cantonese immigrants to Australia have been depicted as stuck in routines of endless work. Frost noted that Market gardeners worked from dawn to dusk. While a member of the shopkeeping family similarly reported that they worked seven days a week and long hours each day. These claims seem true. But Shirley, uh, as Shelley Chan reminds us that this was a synchronic snapshot of a moment in diaspora time. Less apparent were the aspirations of the migrants. My study has shown that away from home, Chinese 
immigrants translating their invisible baggage of debt, family obligations into intensive labor in a foreign land, accumulation of capital and upward mobility ultimately resulted in the participation of diaspora philanthropy. The construction of new schools in the Kilhern provides an alternative narrative to the conventional Western scholarship through focusing on pre tertiary education and an untold story of how migrants created an, an alternative history and hence a different future for, the, for their homeland in southern China. The future narrative of the Kilhern complements the Australian narrative, which is about endless work and is often misinterpreted as the sole narrative of Chinese immigrants in Australia. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Christopher, for such a detailed, fascinating talk. And um, you covered uh, quite a lot. Now we take a few questions. So if anyone has questions, please put in the Q&A section. But before anyone else has asked a question, I have a few. Firstly, this uh, tradition, you know, you, you covered a century from the way back a hundred years ago that uh, Chinese migrants or the diaspora, they have this tra tradition of funding schools in their hometown. Do you find um, the similar, similar tradition in other uh, ethnic migrants or di diasporas, you know, apart from Chinese? Um, I've been thinking about this question, and I think it depends on the priorities and needs of that immigrant group. I heard from somebody recently, they immigrated from, I think, Turkey or Germany, and they told me that um, they could relate to this narrative because uh, migrants from there, um, migrants have contributed to, to a new swimming pool in their community. So I guess... Um, it actually depends on the needs and the priorities of that community and what they uh, want um, to contribute. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, you know, I can see if it happens to others. Uh, the other question that I have is um, this um, reason, kind of a reason, I mean, you, you've done your such a detailed research. What are the causes of funding schools? I mean, they're funding other things, but schools are primary, primarily schools. Uh, do you think that um, uh, you mentioned a lack of literacy and that seems to be a contribution because back then, you know, Michael Williams had a talk about the dictation test and that's really on the literacy and that's a discrimination against the Chinese migrants in particular. And the other day I went to Cooktown and that I also saw a document, they have a test of 50 words for um, sugar industry migrants, and again, primarily targeted to Chinese migrants. You, you just need to write 50 words in English, and which they found very difficult to do, so they protested. So ended up you can write 50 words in any language, but even that, that caused a difficult. So is that lack of literacy is the motivation for funding school? Or and is that like a, tr a tradition? You know, education is a tradition uh, in Chinese culture. So what um, are yeah? In the village, as you know, um, some people don't. Um, if they were continuing to carry on like um, the farm work, following the footsteps of their father or grandfather, there would probably be little need for any literacy. Like in, anything that you would learn, you can do by observing or even asking people who have um, lived that experience before. Like they know how to um, survive through famines or um, use different tools or um, grow different crops. I think um, migration actually helped change things. When um, Chinese begin to migrate, they were um, that to correspond with people in the um, home village, uh, writing letters um, and being able to read letters. This changed it. Like there was a practical dimension that wasn't there in the past, and also receiving information about um, 
um, what was happening in the world, like newspapers and trying to understand um, where to go or um, what's safe or um, what was happening that, would, that could affect business. And um, there's another issue whether a, a village or a community would build a school or not. It also depended on um, what the, that community was facing. Some communities, for example, they were um, constantly um, threatened by floods, for example. Their primary concern would be to um, would be for disaster relief, um, accommodating the people in the community and also build, building um, better dams and bridges. And school, although may be on the agenda, is not the urgent need. But for the um, communities that had um, resources, education was a long-term um, investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no oh, good. Uh, we have two questions. They are kind of a similar, but the first question is, will the di uh, diaspora continue to support education? I, I think I mentioned this in my um, talk towards the end or throughout the period, like whenever the diaspora return, they always fi find a way that they can contribute and whether it's directly but giving money to um, improve the classroom or uh, or even now when they don't actually need that money some of uh, some of the department stores in hong kong actually um, give money to the village to fund scholarships so um students can be motivated to achieve better grades so there will be always ways to contribute to education. And so I think it it's it's not will they, but it's how will they? Mm -hmm. I think that's the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. The next question is really interesting. Janet to ask this question. Now that the state China in China has taken over education in China, so is diaspora philo philanthropy changing the focus of their philanthropy? And is diaspora philanthropy welcomed? by the government of China? Um, I mentioned a bit about this in my previous talk. Um, I mentioned in beginning to um, 2010s, um, as China got richer, they could start building their own schools. Mm. And some of the schools were actually um, built with the same name as the previous schools that the donors had um, the Chinese Australian donors had built. So uh, it was a continuation of this legacy of um, remembering those who had contributed. So in a way, um, the Chinese government is interested in remembering this history, but it no longer needs that financial support. And what, what they have done is to invite the descendants of those original donors back to the schools to um, for the opening ceremony and involve them as like uh, patrons. Mm. So I guess um, the, the contribution is very different. Mm. A last a little quick question is, in the schools that you investigated, uh, researched, was there any school for girls only? Uh, yes, there were. Um, in the early 20th century, there were schools for uh, only girls, and there were also dormitories to assist them to, because um, some girls, um, their, their families may not allow them to um, walk to school, which was quite far away. So um, having dormitories and schools, uh, particularly in Sacho, actually um, meant that they were providing a integrated strategy to help girls go to school. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, 
Last question from John. John says that you've done uh, the great talk and you done your research is primarily in Zhongshan diaspora community. Did you do any research in other communities such as Shanghai? I didn't do any research in Shanghai, but I talked to people who have lived or worked in Shanghai during my research, and they said that because the Zhongshan diaspora were also working and living in Shanghai, they also donated schools in Shanghai. So the um, the workers and the uh, the fact the department store owners and the factory um, that were affiliated, they could send their children to school. So it was a yeah okay. Thank you so much. And we run over time, but yeah, thank you so much, Christopher, for this wonderful, great talk. And um, congratulations again on the completion of your PhD. And clearly you have done a lot in over the last four years, you know, from the first time you saw that this Chinese character on our wall to where you are now, it's amazing. So you have achieved a lot. We're so proud of you and uh, well done. So this is the last session of our Chinese Australian History Online series, uh, 2022. We will continue the series in 2023, and we welcome recommendations of our speakers or self-recommendations. Please send your recommendations through to me. And thank you all for your ongoing support to this series and to Australian Chinese history researchers. I'm looking forward to having you again in 2023. So have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.